My name is Richard Falk. I am the Milbank Professor of International Law Emeritus at Princeton University and since 2002 visiting distinguished uh, professor in global studies at UCSB. Uh, selected by the UN Human Rights Council to be the special rapporteur for occupied Palestine. I, I think it's important from at least my perspective to acknowledge that one's really uh, uh, trying to give shape to what might be called a necessary utopia. Necessary because the present f political forms that organize most of our activity on the planet are uh, very precarious and unlikely to be sustainable in their present form, utopian because it seems uh, impossible to overcome these obsolescent or anachronistic uh, political forms uh, by any uh, viable political project. So what seems necessary also seems impossible. And so any restructuring of the existing order of governance is in one sense a experiment in what I call the politics of impossibility. That is uh, acknowledging that what appears to be feasible is um, not sufficiently responsive to the challenges confronting humanity at this stage, the dangers of nuclear war or climate change or the uh, scale of world poverty and all of these uh, issues don't seem to be manageable within the framework we have, but also there doesn't seem to be the political foundations for transforming that framework. So it is in that sense a, um, a reliance on the political and moral imagination to suggest what it is that could uh, bring us to a more um, desirable and sustainable state of affairs. The West, uh, especially in light of um, the rise of science and technology and the Enlightenment kind of understanding of human progress, uh, came to the misleading conclusion that this was the foundation of un a universal reality. And um, contemporary human rights have been uh, so evolved out of that understanding that what the West believed was the appropriate way for people to um, treat each other and be treated by governments was also the appropriate way for everyone on the planet, including indigenous peoples and others. But the more w this uh, universalist claim has been explored, the more it has revealed the existence of important uh, diversities that need to be taken into account if one is to work towards some kind of global democracy, some kind of um, world order that uh, acknowledges the um, values and identities that are uh, distributed around the world in light of the 9-11 attacks and the um, under misunderstanding of the degree to which those attacks can be attributed to religious motivations and how that uh, enters into uh, this uh, new post-colonial concern with a world that cannot 
be understood purely through a Western prism. And uh, the uh, historical period has led me also to have an interest in uh, the rise of non-Western civilizations and the importance of interpreting this rise as a opportunity for a more inclusive understanding of world order and uh, an avoidance of the kind of conflictual imagery that was associated with the clash of civilization type hypothesis. The importance of adopting a kind of more critical understanding of um, human values, human identities, is part of the uh, limitation of the Western uh, conception. For most of the world, what comes from the West is viewed with suspicion because they've experienced its oppressive and exploitative sides. And uh, th there is a definite uh, assertion of um, different uh, forms of uh, development that are emerging in the world under the misleading uh, commonality of globalization. But what is happening in China and India and elsewhere is creating a new geopolitical landscape, a post-colonial geopolitical landscape uh, that also is not one that um, can any longer be understood as a merely Western struggle between uh, Marxism and liberalism. And so I think we need this more differentiated conception of wor world history if we're to understand adequately the kind of uh, global reality that confronts us at the present time.